Welcome to a new installment of History in the Time of Pandemics, the podcast companion to the special issue of ISIS current bibliography on pandemics, the final version of which was just released a few weeks ago. I'm Nirja Sankaran, co-editor of the special issue, along with Stephen Weldon, the bibliographer for HSS, and I am the anchor for this podcast series, through which we hope to facilitate conversations among various participants, both authors of various bibliographic essays, as well as peer reviewers, in order to foster ongoing engagement with the very relevant issues that were raised in the volume. Now, in our first episode, we heard from authors and reviewers of essays on topics basic to a general understanding of infectious diseases and pandemics. In today's episode, we will be chatting with scholars who study the effects of such diseases on human society and also conversely, how various societal structures and practices influence the way in which pandemic diseases are experienced and how they are spread. I'm delighted to welcome Keith Weilu, Kavita Shivaramakrishnan and Emily Hamilton, and we'll lose no time in turning the mic over to them so that they may introduce themselves and their contributions. Keith, would you go first? Sure, yeah, I'm Keith Weilu. I'm a faculty member at Princeton in history and the School of Public and International Affairs. And I wrote along with a former graduate student, Michael McGovern, who's now a postdoctoral fellow at Yale, uh, an essay called Epidemic Inequities, which looked at the long history of scholarship on social and racial inequities that are both exposed, aggravated, and produced by pandemics. Thank you. Kavita? Thank you. Thank you for the introductions and for having us here, Nirja, today. I'm Kavita Sivaramakrishnan. I'm a historian of medicine and public health. I've been interested in indigenous medicine, looking at the politics specifically of epidemics, and also been working on aging and chronic diseases. I've had the honor of editing this essay, The Limits of Linearity, Recasting Histories of Epidemics in the Global South, with my graduate student, Valentina Parisi, who's the key author, co-author. She is really gifted and insightful. Valentina is a six-year doctoral student with us in our joint program with the history department. And what she really brings to the table, I thought, was that she has a training in pathobiology and she's also worked in laboratories researching influenza. So that was particularly interesting because it overlaps with her work and I thought an essay like this would be ideal for us to collaborate. So I would like to thank her and all of you also for this opportunity. Thank you. And Emily, tell us a little bit about your contribution, please. Hi, I'm Emily Hamilton. I'm a historian of science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I was approached at the 2020 HSS meeting. And at that point, I was introduced to the special issue project idea, and I was asked if I might be interested in contributing a historiographical essay on epidemics and numbers or how historians of disease have historically utilized quantitative methods, statistics, demography, population studies, etc. So while I'm not a historian of medicine exactly, I work on history of mathematics and also teach widely in the history of medicine here in my position at UMass. I readily agreed, but I soon thereafter actually withdrew my submission, and I offered some reason for that, of course, including my increasing concern that a lot of the scholarship I was amassing for my bibliography didn't itself demonstrate a mathematical approach, but rather kind of used the methods of mathematical approaches from other disciplines as evidence. And I also explained that my work categorizing historical scholarship into disciplinary trends really mimicked the categorization presented by a lot of the other contributors of the essay. In particular, my own periodization mirrored that offered in Honingsbaum's essay on influenza to such a degree as to be redundant, I thought, for the issue. And I offered some suggestions for areas where periodization might be meaningfully expanded, but I didn't feel that my own expertise extended to this kind of scholarship. I should say here, as I did in my conversations about withdrawing my essay, that there are, of course, scholars who are utilizing mathematical approaches in the history of disease. In my initial work on the project, however, I became increasingly convinced that an approach to studying mathematical and quantitative approaches to studying history of disease is not to only create a bibliography of historical approaches, but to provide for historians of science, to provide for our audience, 
a bibliography of sources created by what's known as historians in lab coats. And there's really, really a rich and growing interdisciplinary literature that continues to inform historical scholarship. And a bibliography of the approach taken in the sciences and quantitative social sciences that investigate historic disease would be really fascinating. This essay, however, wasn't one that I was prepared to write, and I wasn't entirely convinced that it belonged in this special issue at all, actually, as it opened up questions about the limits of historical scholarship, the definitions of history as a profession, which are, of course, interesting, but not really within the scope of the issue. So with all of these comments in tow, I was asked instead to see if I, I would be interested in taking a kind of sweeping view of the entire issue, and I readily agreed to that. I was thrilled to be able to continue to contribute to such an exciting project. So thank you so much for having me in the issue and here today. My first question is for Keith specifically, and that has to do with why you chose to home in on racial inequity rather than make this essay about inequities more broadly, which was sort of my vague conception when I approached you, although I didn't make it clear. And factors such as, you know, I thought originally factors such as economic status, geographic location would all lead to inequities. But reading through your fascinating essay, I began to get why you had to pick your battles. And just the racial inequities literature gave us a 30-page essay with a bibliography of some 200-odd sources. And I imagine you could provide similar-sized essays and bibliographies on other matters of inequality as well, such as poverty. So other than your personal interest in the topic of race, I was wondering if you could say something about your own process, how you came to pick this particular angle. Uh, on your essay, and also something more broadly about different sorts of inequalities that come to fore in pandemic times? I'm sorry, that was a very long question. (laughs) Thanks, Niraja, for the question. I'll correct you a little bit, which is to say that the essay does not actually principally focus on racial inequality. In fact, it starts with a reflection of Daniel Defoe's writings about the plague year in 17th century London, in which he says that the infection kept chiefly in the out parishes, which being very populous and fuller, alas, of the poor, the distemper found more to prey upon than in the city. And it continues to talk about the German physician and anthropologist Rudolf Virchow in the outbreak of typhus in 1848, in which he explains that it is the wretched conditions of life that poverty created and the lack of culture that explains the impact of typhus. And and we really pivot from that to explain the fundamental social explanations, the social dynamics, the social conditions that have long been seen as central to explaining disparities in infection rates, disparities in exposure, disparities in hospitalization, and the last disparities in mortality that have been the focus of scholarship uh, really from Virchow's time forward. So that the essay really starts with a f- with a attention to the, the ways in which the historical scholarship that is informed by Virchow's approach to thinking about the social history of pandemic and disease effects and how that ripples, that resonates in the scholarship. And then the question of race, the question of the Black experience in the United States becomes at a certain point in the historiography, a really central focal point. But we also address issues of the Native American experience with smallpox. In other words, there is sadly, a wide range of ways in which social inequalities manifest themselves as pandemic inequalities. It just so happens that in the United States experience, one of the key lenses through which we understand this is the African-American experience. But that doesn't really become central in the scholarship until quite late in the bibliography and in the historical scholarship. I'll say one last thing, which is the impetus for writing this was the fact that in 2020, what we were looking at is infection, hospitalization, and mortality rates climbing precipitously 
in New York City during a lockdown in which the observations of Defoe, the observations of Virchow seem to be not just historically relevant, but quite current. We're looking at density of housing in New York City, multi-generational families, exposure in nursing homes, cruise ships, right, being a kind of like vehicles that actually uh, proliferate, and then the extraordinary disparities in Black, Latinx, and also Navajo uh, reservations, which lack running water. So it seemed to us in the history of medicine generally, and from Mikey McGovern and myself, that this was a moment when the past and the present were colliding. And it was a moment in which the the totality of the historical observations about pandemics was really meeting its moment. That is to say, COVID was calling forth historians to pivot from a historical conversation with which we were quite familiar to bring that knowledge to bear for a wider audience that was suddenly deeply interested in how this story would play out. Thank you. And I said corrected about the focus, but There are other things that your essay brought up, and Emily in particular noticed one that I'm going to hand the mic over to her, and she will ask the question still to you, Keith. Yes, so Keith, you dedicate a portion of your essay to scholarship on HIV AIDS, and could you explain a little bit more here how you see the emergence of AIDS as a disease directly impacting a historiographical shift, how historians have approached histories of disease? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, Great question. You know, in our lifetimes, I would say COVID is, is the second pandemic that we have experienced. But before AIDS, I think it would, it's safe to say that most historians of public health, most historians of disease and medicine, thought of pandemics and epidemics as phenomena that occurred sporadically in the global south and and phenomena which the Western industrialized democracies had transcended in some fundamental way. That is that in the great story of the epidemiological transition, the idea that, you know, We used to be a society that lived with recurring pandemics, cholera, yellow fever, influenza, even polio, that we had somehow kind of grown beyond them. They were things of the past. And AIDS was a brutal reminder that this was not the case, that, you know, we'd call them now emerging infectious diseases. But AIDS, SARS, MERS, but AIDS really figured as a really central one. And the AIDS pandemic made historians more sensitive to certain features of pandemics that they had not previously addressed. I think one is the the fact of stigma associated with particular groups, issues of identity, and issues of how the, the kind of moral judgment about who is affected could be also layered atop ideas about, in this case, sexuality, sexual behavior, and so that the broader issues of identity and the politics of identity really came to the fore in how historians thought, not just about the AIDS experience, but about pandemics and epidemics in general. And I'll say one last thing, which is that AIDS also exposed the, insofar as You know, in the United States, for instance, there was concern about whether leadership was even willing to address these fraught issues of sexuality and pandemics, brought forth the troubling question of the relationship between medicine and the state. And and so while the AIDS story began as a story of sexuality, the state, trust in government, and also trust in therapies, these were all sort of exposed, AIDS also changed demographically. By the 1990s, you know, in the United States anyway, there was a sense that AIDS isn't a, a, quote, gay disease as much as it is a disease that is rising in prevalence among minority populations, among African Americans, among women, among Black folks. So it also sensitized, I think, historians to the idea that pandemics change, and pandemics have a kind of a a long tail, long after society becomes exercised and aggravated about pandemic effects, that in some ways the pandemic evolves and the evolution of the pandemic became a topic of increasing interest as well. Thank you so much for that. And I am 
I'm so interested, I'm struck in reading all of these essays, the ways in which the contributors look at specific disease to demonstrate precedent, to look at how we've been been writing the history of disease over time. And Kavita, I'm I'm really curious to hear more about what you were saying and how your work examines historical narratives of cholera in particular and how that helped identify pervasive frameworks used by historians of pandemics. And you say that these might work to flatten the narrative, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about how cholera in particular did that for historians. Yeah, thank you, Emily. I think cholera is an interesting example. Actually, it brought Valentina and me back to understanding how our work, I mean, she, she's she been trained as a historian of American history of medicine. I've primarily worked in South Asia with a comparative focus sometimes looking at South Asia and Africa and colonialism. But I think cholera, for instance, brings really together this question of origins, for instance. How can we think about cholera as not coming from one place, which is, you know, the river valley of the Ganges, Asiatic cholera, which was often seen as a place of origin. And it's always representing a threat from Asia or from, you know, a threat from the rest to the West, if I might put it that way. And in that sense, I think when we look at cholera, it brings in so many aspects that allow us to actually unpack some of the silos we've had in histories of medicine. I think the first is, of course, the questions of origin. The second is also how we tell very linear histories. We tell very, very kind of disease-centric histories, and cholera, in a way, helps us to integrate histories of health with environment. It helps us to really unpack and understand how, with colonization, you see the growth of urbanization, you see the breakdown of local ecological systems, leading to the proliferation of cholera around certain waterways, affecting populations who were not affected before. And cholera also brings out another aspect, which is often missing from history of medicine, which is to tie up history of medicine to also understand not simply colonization and colonial power, but also to understand the role of non-state actors like medical missionaries, for instance. One of the important aspects of cholera in Asia and Africa was, of course, that the missionaries associated cholera with what they termed as dens of of vice, you know, Hindu temples, places of worship, wherever they were dense congregations. And of course, Asiatic and people from Africa were always seen as having these dense congregations of populations that tended to be both carriers of a disease, but also carriers of a kind of heretic religion. So you, you, you see through cholera this link with pilgrimage, for instance. The British were constantly involved during the early Indian, uh, the international sanitary conferences with linking cholera not simply to trade colonialism and the visceral exploitation that was, you know, with, that underlay colonialism, but to associate it with religion. The fact that people went on a pilgrimage, that Muslims went on a pilgrimage to Mecca, the fact that Groups of people accumulated and spread cholera due to their customs and religion and other things, rather than the rationale of trade, which at all costs, they wanted to make sure that cholera should not be the reason why they should be banned from trading along the coast from South Asia to all along the Mediterranean coast. So cholera really brings in this issue of bringing in religion, for instance, the use in colonialism of custom. And also, I think what it does bring in is that Cholera is not simply a thing of the distant past. When we think about international and global health, it comes up right up again. If you want to look at narratives of the beginnings of the World Health Organization in places like Haiti, there's the infamous epidemics of cholera in Haiti, which were linked to the WHO being quite, you know, and there were later admissions from the UN forces that their own occupation, their own occupation through UN troops could have brought cholera from one space to the other and infected local populations. So there are these very complicated questions, I think, about cholera, which are important to see and kind of they make us integrate and take away the silos between thinking that we are historians of Asia or Africa, we are historians of US history, and diseases in that sense, just as they tend to silo the ways in which we analyze. I think cholera in particular is such a fluid and movable kind of disease entity. And it arrives often, and that's the, the kind of final comment I want to make. Cholera, of course, often arrives as a disease not only of poverty, but after a series of other catastrophes. So in, in India, for instance, in Madras presidency, you would often have the arrival of cholera after a famine, 
after a plague. So it kind of compounds what already exists because of a huge breakdown of infrastructure. And that's not simply a colonial fact. We know with forced displacement, whether it's in the Middle East or parts of Africa, wherever there's been seeds of crisis, the first report that the Médecins Sans Frontières and others will file is that there are cases of cholera locally because just the absence of clean water for displaced populations. So I think it really knits together in a way what we think of as being separate areas of study, which is colonial medicine, international health, which is seen as a, a study of the WHO, and then global health, which is seen as a as an emerging kind of field, which has non-state actors, these international actors, and are moving away, as Keith said, from a conventional perspective that we've actually laid to rest these infectious diseases. But actually, there's such a circularity and a sense constantly of, of these diseases being interconnected with each other through social asymmetries and marginality that, you know, until we address the fundamental causes, as we always told, you know, we can't really say that infectious diseases have been challenged. In fact, one of the things I think cholera brings out is really the ways in which we can read history in some ways sideways. It allows us to look across rather than kind of silo some of these narratives. I want to take a step back with you and ask you something about your process of how your essay came together. As in Keith's case, my request for you was a rather nebulous one. We asked for a bibliographic essay on the political ramifications of pandemic disease. You brought up a lot of these issues in talking about cholera specifically, but my request to you yielded a far more focused essay on the global south than perhaps I had imagined, because I think of politics and Keith had brought up the issue of HIV AIDS and the political response to it or the politically motivated non-response to it in the 80s under the Reagan era in North America. And politics, of course, is everywhere. But so I wanted to ask you to please take us through the process of focusing your bibliography and fashioning your essay along with Valentina for this volume. Thanks, Nija. I think that's an interesting question, because when you asked us to author this and we decided that we would co-author this together, I think what we were trying to understand is what exists respectively in our fields in common, which in some ways restricts us from thinking out of the box when we think of epidemics and pandemics. And looking from the global south, in a way, for us, was just not a point of departure, but actually the Global South in that essay, as you can see, and in that sense, I also want to make a small correction. We focused on the Global South, but we come right circularly back when we think of influenza, for instance, to arrive back to think of influenza and the fog of epidemics or the kind of false scares that happened in the US. So in a way, what we were trying to do is instead of what is often told as a story, from uh, from the US and Europe and a resonance often that happens with a delay or later with modernization in parts of the global south. We were trying to tell the story in a way in which it came from the global south, but to try to integrate the US as to show that they all come together. And in a way for us, the fundamental framing that we wanted to challenge was this notion that there was a phase of colonial medicine. There was a phase of international health, and there is a phase of global health in which all of us live. And I think both our colleagues as well as students find that incredibly convenient. And it's a very good and illustrated device to enter certain debates about epidemics and infectious diseases. But we also found that both looking at histories of medicine, medicine in the US, as well as in the global south, this, was a, this is a bit of a problematic silos between these three phases. And to look at it from South Asia or Southeast Asia would really help us to understand that there were constantly connections between these phases. So I think our approach really was to think about how the end of colonization or the end of political colonization, say, of India in 1947, did not mean that certain diseases break there and populations became independent and therefore everyone became a citizen who was equal. So there's a kind of carryover of disease burdens. There's a carryover of colonial structures that happens to decolonized context. So in that sense, the, the arrival of the WHO with international health, of course, marks a period of optimism and the rise of, of countries who were formerly colonized and who now become independent. So it's a, it's a moment of, of a kind of optimism. 
But we also saw that we, what we were trying to trace through diseases was to say that colonization lingers and histories of disease actually help us to understand these continuities. And as historians, of course, continuity and change and contextually to interpret it in terms of power was really interesting for us. So I think seeing these continuities and looking beyond these boundaries was really critical for us, including to see the transition from international to global health as, as not being as kind of finite as people think it to be, you know, that, that one thing ends, the, the, the influence of the WHO kind of rolls back. And what we see is a world where the state is not important anymore, the national boundaries are not important anymore. And what we have with globalization is a kind of a contextual power of, of big corporations and other things. So in, in global health, and you know, which comes in with HIV AIDS, as Keith remarked. So in a way, what we were trying to do was to show both continuities as well as disruptions in this narrative. And to kind of answer your question directly, I think geographical spaces and telling this a little bit differently from other places helped us to say that there is no majoritarian, there is no kind of main thesis here. You could actually challenge what happens in the big debates in history of medicine and see the connections between the spaces. So in a way, we are all working on the same problems. And I think for students reading our historiographies, they'll actually understand though that they are divided in history departments as Americanists and South Asianists and Africanists or whatever else. But actually, we are part of the same collective enterprise. And when we share a certain similar social solidarity and politics, and I think we all do in these essays, then actually we are asking similar questions. And we are all trying to understand why epidemics, even when they are supposedly ending epidemiologically or they're called to an end by some, Actually, the social inequities linger. In fact, they get aggravated and they just get carried over to the next crisis. So I think the concerns and anxieties are so similar. It helps to kind of get an opportunity, as you offered us, to work together, which doesn't happen in journals, which are journals of regional study. You know, so I think what ISIS has crafted here is remarkable because actually we, it brings together conversations which couldn't have happened in more traditional traditional fields or, or sites of publication. Yeah, if I could jump in because I so much of what Kavita says is so fascinating. One observation I have is the fact that this kind of blurring of historical periodization, but also blurring of the past and the present is so much, I think, a central feature of what has happened or what is happening in the COVID moment. That is to say, Kavita's remarks on cholera highlight to me the way in which, you know, much of what she's describing of how you think about cholera using the lens of history and in some ways the sociology of medicine and science makes the past so current and vital. So for instance, in describing cholera as a challenge to governance, reminding us that there's a kind of a long geopolitics of pandemics. So whereas we're kind of caught up in this COVID moment where we're grappling with the geopolitical tensions, efforts to destabilize other countries with misinformation, using the pandemic as a means of leverage, both within a country, but across national contexts, what she was describing is these efforts to govern cholera while creating global surveillance systems, ports and quarantines, the politics of blame, as in, what do you call this? Do you call it Asiatic cholera? And how does that attribution shape the sort of the geopolitics of global surveillance? We have this very same experience, right? The first two years of COVID, we named variants for the geography, right? The India variant, the South Africa variant, the UK variant. And it was the U, it was the WHO that finally kind of stepped in and said, let's call the India variant the Delta variant, because this naming needs to pivot away from geographical naming and blaming and the policy responses that emerge in the wake to something that really blinds us 
to these geographical specificities. So, so what Kavita was describing in the history of cholera is what, at once in the past, but at the same time, it's actually part and parcel of our current experience. And I guess I just want to echo her observation, which is it's not just the blurring of the apparent so-called so stages of colonial medicine to global health, but it's also this sense that we are, as one of my colleagues said, we find ourselves in COVID, like living in our history books, <laughs> living in the kind of like, we've seen this before. And the question is, what what variation on the historical theme is this that we are grappling with? I just wanted to say that because it turns out that you know, if, if you're talking about tuberculosis or cholera or yellow fever or the Black Death or typhus or smallpox or AIDS or influenza, we could go on. These are all microcosms of this broader conversation. Keith, you, you mentioned surveillance, and I think that one of the interesting things that we we see is how when we think about in the past what groups have been surveilled in the context of, of pandemics and epidemics, we see how that shapes historical scholarship because of available data and also the understanding of disease, etiology, and experience. And I think that, Kavita, you're arguing that periodization is kind of also shaping the same, the same way. I feel at times your argument is one of semantics, that historians have embraced some terminology that supports this idea of, of kind of an objective analytic framework like the emergence of global health following decolonized medicine, when, when in reality these frameworks are obscuring far more historical continuity. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this idea that, that we need to be really careful about our grouping as, his, as historians, that we need to be really careful about our language in terms of how we are shaping a historical scholarship. Thank you, Keith and Emily. Yeah, I, you mean in terms of groupings, in terms of whom we call out and what we call out as a disease? Is that what you mean, Emily? I think I'm speaking more toward your idea that that some of our periodization is doing exactly the is is flattening the curve, right? Is is really simplifying the the overall narrative that we have, and right now we're seeing work that you point out is importantly challenging some of these oft-held beliefs, which I think is part of the, the really important work of the Bibliography Project, is being able to take an expansive view of the ways in which historians have, have moved through disciplinary trends. Right. And I think the periodization question brings us to something that Keith was referring to, which is the politics of why this kind of periodization occurs. I mean, it's not simply in academic institutions or universities. What he's bringing out is also there's a sense of the politics, the geopolitics. So I think academics is also shaped by what we take for granted, which is coming out from, you know, Cold War politics. And I think Keith's essay really does this very well, which is the ways in which there are historians of medicine who are being shaped by what's happening in America in the 1950s and 60s, right? So you have those who are able to push back, but you also have other historians who, who kind of fall in line and say, well, this is a time when infectious diseases can be conquered through biomedicine. And what they're trying to say is that there's a very easy techno-scientific solution, but people like Segrist and others push back against this and say that, you know, you can't trap us in this way of thinking simply because of this bigger biomedical enterprise, because of the ways in which America is becoming this major kind of figure in that time of the Cold War. So I think geopolitics operates not only in this binary sense of the West and the rest. What I've tried to unpack is that you know, the influenza is a very interesting situation because just as the West fears that the influenza is coming from Asia, the Asian nations are looking at each other too when the boats come down from Hong Kong to Singapore to Chennai to other ports. They are watching each other seeing this contagion spread from each other. So the solidarity even within the global South is, is something that we need to pass out. There are newspaper reports in India that will say, this is actually Mao's flu influenza. So it's very interesting. And that's a time when India is almost on the brink of war in the 1960s with China. So the geopolitics of how epidemiology gets embroiled in the kind of location of disease in certain contexts 
of the periodization based on saying that, look, colonialism has come to an end. We have a new government and disease is going to be quelled through these big biotechno-scientific projects. I think there's something very interesting happening here in terms of the power of the state in entering the realms of science and expertise much more than we would admit it. When you look, instead of epidemiology, when you look at, let me give the example of demography, you can say it much more easily with population control programs. The beginnings and the rise, and in some ways even of the Princeton Bureau of Demography and others, were closely tied to Cold War projects of seeing what was happening in other parts of the world and seeing an intensification of population. But history of medicine and its link to the state to the fact that geopolitics deeply inspired it has not always been, I think, explored sufficiently. And that ties us down to certain kinds of periodization. And also this issue of surveillance, which I think both of you have brought up and which I'd like Keith to elaborate on, because epidemiological surveillance, setting up you know, centers that the CDC sets up in various parts of the world is much more than simply epidemiological surveillance, right? So how does that go, how that, that science go hand in hand with certain kinds of geopolitics is some of the questions I think that underlie our own writings. That's wonderful yeah, because this echoes at least something that Michael McGovern and I also touched on, which is this one of the fascinating features of the, the literature is the way in which epidemiology and statistical evidence has really always been central to the way in which we think about a pandemic or an epidemic, continually valuable, certainly in documenting, right, disparate disease effects, and has long been regarded by the scholarship as kind of objective renderings of disparities or objective renderings of the reality of who was affected. And in some ways, the classic approach is to think about how epidemiology emerged as a response to pandemics in order to grapple with and objectively characterize the toll. And then you increasingly see a, a reliance of state actors of government on quantitative analysis in shaping responses. But I think what's interesting is to see how recently, I'd say in the last maybe 20 years or so, the tendency in the scholarship, the inclination of scholars is to not see the numbers as kind of acting on their own, but numbers are able to mobilize particular kinds of policies, whether it is calling attention to slums and slum eradication or bolstering anti-immigration policies or supporting arguments for quarantine, or in fact, shaping and giving legitimacy to labeling and blaming. So increasingly, scholars have looked at statistics and numbers and epidemiology as a tool of governance, conflicted, contested governance. And we, and we suggest in the essay, you see this important shift in the scholarship where numbers don't just speak objectively for themselves, but we as scholars need to be attentive to the political uses of statistics or even the political generation of production of statistics as surveillance tools and how they become part of the surveillance infrastructure. This is an area that's ripe for deep investigation. And what I want to say also is that as we are looking at this historically, you see it in modern day America. You see it in areas like, you know, the finding that the New York State governor and the administration during COVID purposely depressed the numbers of, reduced the numbers of nursing home deaths in order to, you know, escape blame, to kind of dodge responsibility and to suggest that they were doing a better job with managing COVID than they actually were. So that the politics of both, not, not just like how numbers are created, which numbers are created, and for what political or social or policy effect is in, se in some ways today a kind of live topic, a very a centrally important topic in the scholarship historically, but it's also something that is contentiously debated today as we continue to grapple with COVID. So one of the questions, for instance, that we're all attuned to is, you know, what's the new COVID wave, <laughs> right? Is the new variant going to produce what kind of effect and on whom, L suggesting that we are living in 
a world where we are attentive, deeply attentive to the politics of numbers and their effects in our lives and in social policy. Keith, I, I think that it's really important in your essay that you acknowledge the the sort of rise of statistical methodology in history and how that was met with almost immediate criticism that emerged against quantitative analysis in historical scholarship here. Of course, we're talking about disease that came out of the rise in quantitative demographic and economic analysis in the 1970s. And I think it's important to mention here in particular because this particular project, this bibliographical project, is one that's really encouraging disciplinary discourse and encouraging folks to come together and have conversations about what it means to do history responsibly. And I, I mostly just wanted to put that out there as a comment, but if you have anything to say about the role of, of this criticism within the discipline about new methodologies and how that led to a more responsible use of numbers, data, st statistics, et cetera. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, this this sort of cleometric, you know, statistical turn in the 1970s was a really fascinating one, a kind of fraught moment in which the debate about responsible and irresponsible both uses and extrapolations from quantitative analysis was really central in thinking about issues like slavery, but also issues like Philip Curtin's work on, you know, death by migration and the effects of the slave trade. And I do think that, you know, in some ways, the profession emerged more savvy and thoughtful about these questions of using statistical methodologies artfully and with nuance in order to inform ideas about historical change or in the, the case of our essay, disease change. So thanks for calling attention to that feature of the essay. I wanted to add to this discussion about counting the uses of data and also how I think mortality statistics have often been used, deployed, and even denied and misused. So I think there's two things here. I think the, on the one hand, mortality has been important, but what gets ignored when there's such an emphasis on how many people have died and you know, is this the peak of the disease or not epidemiologically, is that I think in policy circles at the height of a pandemic, what it kind of hides is the fact that there is a huge morbidity that already exists. And it is those who experience that morbidity who are chronically at risk of mortality too. So it's very convenient even for some of the well-known newspapers. And I think even the New York Times so often quoting the mortality rates, there's a refusal or turning away from the complexity of linking morbidity to mortality. And I think Keith's work, for instance, on chronic diseases, on cancers, and a range of other things kind of also help us to think about how this is a syndemic, right? We see the connections between infections and chronicity, and epidemics are about infections, but infections proliferate in places where people already have chronically sick bodies. So I think looking at mortality rates effaces that, not simply outwardly in denial, but it also brings us into the realm of what I see as a kind of uncertainty. And I think governments during COVID have played on saying, not simply denying, but also saying, we are not sure these numbers are right. We are not sure that this is the right intervention or not. So simply saying they are not sure has also helped to kind of build a, a notion of whether we trust experts or not during epidemics. What is the voice of the experts? What's the trust that we build with the state? And I think that's some of the questions which underlie our essays on epidemics, which is this question of power. Who has the right to speak during and what, what is the kind of evidence that people prefer during an epidemic and who is believed during an epidemic, right, based on this game of numbers and how does that help them to govern? And I think some of my work on the plague really shows that however however much the World Health Organization says, we are very transparent in the reporting of malaria or cholera or plague. The power to be able to report and to count mortality and to say this is so-and-so disease, and we saw that during SARS, is really the power of the state to be able to declare it. And there are many governments who have used epidemiology, but also ne neglected to report or to declare that this is so-and-so disease, simply because they just go by the name of the rose or whatever the name of the disease, right? And when it comes to a new disease or something that's a re emerging infection, then you play around with, with that. You don't even report that mortality as anything as or seemingly something innocuous and you pass it off. So I think there are very serious 
implications in this game of classification and enumeration here. And the stakes are much higher than seem obvious because it's mortality is kind of just the tip of the iceberg in this play on uncertainty, in this play of not defining a disease category or, or other things. And in the bid to make everything seem certain, manageable, and you put it on a map. So then you not only put it in a space, but you emplace it, in which case you feel that you have control over it. And I think that's the game of, of power that Keith was speaking about, which is interesting. And Emily, you too. I appreciated that. Thank you. This is just wonderful point that Kavita just made, because, you know, I, we end our essay by talking about voice and whose experience matters. And I think Kavita's observations about the overemphasis on mortality, you know, what it often does is that it pushes out of the frame the full spectrum of health experiences, morbidity being one additional one. So one of the questions that I think historians should also ask about this moment is how will this pandemic be seen and remembered and whose voice and whose experiences will matter? And this is a really profound question of not just like death and mortality, but also the kind of fuller range of experiences that the pandemic has produced. And the historical example that I often think about is polio, right? You know, th there is this sense that, you know, there are some who would argue that polio ended, so to speak, once we had a vaccine without any attention to the long-term disabling experience of having had polio and surviving polio. And in some ways, we're in this zone right now where we can sort of think about COVID purely in terms of mortality, or we can use the lens of something like long COVID, or think about the ripple effects of COVID or its effects on inequality to try to understand the pandemic experience. And I do think that one of the things that historians do particularly well, and, it, and we do it across chronological sweeps of time and across the globe, is to raise this question of voice and perspective and experience. That's one of the areas I think the scholarship has pivoted into in the last you know, generation or so. And I think it puts us in a position to ask the right questions, just not, not about the past, but also about the present and in some ways about the future of something like this pandemic that we're living through. I had a quick question for Keith, if that's okay. And this question of the voice, really raised it. I think you have a discussion on Nayan Shah's work and some of the, the plague in San Francisco. And what occurred to me is I want to kind of end on a more optimistic note, if I may. So on the one hand, we see the power of the state, we see growing asymmetries, but I found that discussion very interesting because while there is a racialization of the plague and Chinese immigrants in San Francisco as undesirable aliens, there's also a certain way in which there's a pushback, right? There's a pushback for them to use the same kinds of data, perhaps, and evidence and, and trying to mobilize public health to perhaps say that, of course, you know, that maybe we can make a claim on citizenship. So in a way, I think what I wanted all of us to think about is what happens then when you don't have a voice, when you are marginalized or epidemics become a time for a, a huge amount of stigma, like we've seen with HIV AIDS, then what happens to how do people find a voice during an epidemic then? That's a wonderful question. And I do think it makes sense to end on an optimistic note with regard to the, the ability to seize, you might say, the moment to make arguments about belonging and citizenship as the Chinese citizens of San Francisco were able to do, pushing back against kind of biased quarantine practices and having those claims about biased quarantine practices recognized by the courts and so on. I teach a course on the kind of the world that pandemics create and things like, you know, labor unrest and challenges and movements for more equitable labor practices in the wake of things like essential workers being put on the front lines to be at greater risk. It's not surprising that in the wake of pandemics, you see these kinds of phenomenon where labor, where workers are es essentially making an argument that, you know, we played a really central role in ensuring that society made its way through this crisis and that we deserve recognition 
and rights in the wake. And so there are these really interesting, you might say, byproducts of pandemics. The case of the plague is a is a perverse one because on the one hand, you had this massive depopulation and you had the massive eradication of peasant workers, but it also in certain contexts, you had the ability of surviving workers to engage in more successful negotiations over things like wages. And some would argue that over the long haul, what you begin to see is the decline of a kind of a surf feudalistic surf economy and the emergence of a kind of, I don't know, medieval historians are constantly debating whether you see the long rise of capitalism in the wake, which of course produces its own inequities. <laughs> so there is one story to be told about how, you know, in the wake of plagues in the wake of pandemics, you have social instability, but you also have, for those who survive and for those who mobilize, the possibility of increasing social status and power and ability to push back against these kinds of inequities. So I just wanted to add, because I think it's really rare that we can sit down for an hour and talk about pandemics and end on a positive note, but I think it's it's important to do so. This project in particular has opened up conversations about the expectations of historians and the responsibility of historians to speak to contemporary issues. And I think that the 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 comments being made about voice and who has a voice and who is able to to share their voice is something that historians have, of course, been talking about for generations and generations. And we see that in these bibliographical projects. But I want to point out something that is said in the introduction to this special issue, that the COVID pandemic has irrevocably changed the way that we teach and do research and maintain our scholarly communities. And I'm interested to, to hear a little bit more about how that has happened for, for both of you, Kavita and Keith, and also how these sort of new avenues, these new areas of discourse have allowed the conversation to expand to those who might have previously not had a voice. I think it's it was in the midst of the second wave that I began to teach this new course on pandemics. And the experience, I think what struck me was the experience of teaching it at that time on Zoom and to continue to teach it a few years later showed me the difference, even as a historian, how students respond very differently in the classroom to be talking and discussing a pandemic in the midst of it when it was it was almost a class when people were turning to talk about their own personal experiences. And sometimes at that point, I felt the reason as historians, we are even able to analyze what we live through in an epidemic or pandemic is often because we have a distance from it. So, you know, when you have the challenge of both needing to do the readings and look at them with a certain perspective and difference, and yet you embody and live a pandemic, how do you reconcile the two when you're living with the grief, the lived grief, the embodied grief of losing people, of being in communities who are affected? So I felt at that time that suddenly, as a historian of epidemics and pandemics, who would often speak about it and is culpable of having talked about it as if it was in the past, it no longer was that. It was very much a lived experience. And then over time, after two, two years, when you teach it again, it raises a series of other questions. Is the pandemic, like Keith said, is the pandemic really over? When does the pandemic get over? And are we chronically living in it? Are we being made to believe that it's over when it's not? What makes us measure and manage a pandemic? And then the questions of what is the political and epidemiological horizon? What is the future? Do pandemics come back? And then I think what's really interesting is that students have increasingly begun to see this connection between health and climatic histories. They'll see the they see the COVID pandemic as not just being created by a pathogen, but the, the way it was handled as representing a broader societal or ecological crisis. So they are also very, I think, quickly able to link that to understanding that this is this is not health or medical history or epidemic history that is separate but it links to so much else they are living with, even in terms of a climate and an ecological crisis. So I think what it's helped us to do is possibly to, to live and teach it, but also to move away from it in very productive ways. And with students thinking of it, not simply as a positive ending, but as a narrative that's moving along 
And I think that's what is interesting, because if you can even sow some doubts, like we've been trying to do through these essays, about asking questions about data, asking about the nature of state power, about uh, the historiography of, you know, biomedicine, for instance. And I think it helps us to think that maybe we are teaching a generation of students who will at least be, be able to ask the right questions. I'm not saying we can end on a positive note of trying to find the answers. But just, just that, I think that critical reasoning, I think epidemics have allowed us to do. And particularly COVID has opened up a, a new set of lenses, I think, that have been very valuable for, for all of us. So I will also add that the pandemic also provoked me to not just do the bibliographical project that we're discussing, but also teach a course called Making Post-Pandemic Worlds, Epidemic History in the Future. And so it's very forward-looking. And the question that I pose to my students, many of whom are in public policy, is what's the world that emerges in the wake of pandemic uh, and what's your role in it? And just to kind of describe the course very briefly, because it brings our conversation full circle, it is a, a historical blurring. That is to say, it doesn't pay attention to, it doesn't go from the Black Death to COVID. It doesn't go week by week. It asks pretty general questions of the kind that we're asking. What are the causes and what are the effects of pandemics? Whether you're talking about Black Death, Yellow Fever, COVID, AIDS, polio. What, what's the story of inequality? What is the question of blame? And what are the different aftermaths? That's how we start the class. But then we move into very specific policy areas like managing misinformation or government power and civil liberties or the question of faith and trust or questions about like how to, how, what's the politics of new behaviors, right? Whether it's condom use or vaccination or hygiene campaigns, like how does the public, you know, how do we kind of encourage and create new behaviors and what's the politics of new behaviors? And then we do talk about the future of work, questions of globalization, and then we end on these questions of narrative, whose memoirs and whose memories matter. And then finally, as Kavita just mentioned, like stepping back to what extent are the sort of pandemics a referendum, a judgment on ecological and environmental imbalance of certain kinds or economic imbalance of certain types? And what are therefore the policy solutions that we need to embrace for bringing a world that's quote, out of balance back into balance? So to me, those are the kind of forward looking themes that are embedded in the historical literature and it gives me the opportunity to kind of pivot from the decrying the negatives of a pandemic to asking, where do we go from here? And as I said, like blurring the conventional historical rendering of pandemics, right? Which is, you know, there was this era or this, this era and asking these general questions that have been asked across time. So great question. And I think Kavita's point, we have to seed in our students the ability to ask questions in an informed way about the experience that we're having and to bring history into that, right? To make it a resource for navigating into the future. Thank you. All of these have been fascinating and absolutely important answers. And, you know, you each raised questions that could lead on to several other conversations, but I can't ask them all now. But I do want to bring this back to this particular project. And so I have a question for all three of you, actually, and if you could give the short elevator pitch ver version of it, I know that all of you as experts in particular areas of history of medicine have written a lot, both before and during, and when, if there is an after the pandemic, about uh, actual, uh, you know, written actual articles. And this project was different in that it was a bibliographic article. And I have a two-pronged question about this. What was different and important about undertaking this kind of assignment during the pandemic. I mean, a lot of people refused to do this kind of essay when I asked simply because they were busy, they were on, in the field and they felt they didn't have time to reflect yet, but you did. And I thank you all very much for that. But I'd like to know a little bit about this bibliographic format and how it helped you, if it has helped you, with your scholarship. And this is my last question for the evening. <laughs>
I'll jump in here because my my elevator pitch is, is fairly brief, but this goes back to my comments about the responsibility of historians. And I think that this project was really important to me personally and professionally as a moment in which I think we were all really aware of the 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 moment in time that we were living in at the emergence of COVID as folks who are interested in the historical precedent of pandemics. And I think that this project allowed me to really think carefully about the responsibility and power that historians have in shaping these narratives. So having the opportunity to go back and look at the ways in which other historians have have wielded this power and thought about it carefully themselves has has shaped the way I've thought about my my role as a public facing intellectual. Kavita? Yeah, I think I just want to build on what Emily said. I, it's true. I think if anything, this call, when I got that message from both you and Stephen, I think it was important for me because I also felt that, you know, ISIS has a specific kind of format which one associates with. It's a, it's a, it's a journal which you read. It has conventional articles. So to me, the fact that all of you were breaking the mold and trying to rethink the ways in which you could present ideas, the ways in which you could have these kind of essays, meant that it was a call that the profession itself was actually willing to make a shift in the midst of this pandemic. So I think it was important for me particularly because it also meant that I felt that I didn't feel alone. I felt that when I was reading other people's work, I felt a certain solidarity that the questions I was asking, the experience we were living through, it's almost a kind of intellectual therapy to read other people's work at that time, respect it, and also then feel that what made for changes. I enjoyed reading parts of Keats and Mickey's essay where they talk about how you know, there was a certain mindset in the ways in which historiography is referred to epidemics and how it shifts over time. And it makes you think not only about the evidence that people use, but also how historians are social subjects and social entities and what has shaped us. So it makes you also get into a certain phase of self-reflection. Am I a historian of my time? So in a way, a historiography allows you to stand a little bit outside of yourself. You don't have the stress to necessarily kind of have a, an argument that you have to deploy and, and a thesis. But on the other hand, it makes you think about the historian's craft to look at your colleagues who've written about this before and to look at it with much greater empathy. But also, I think, of, uh, I mean, like Emily said, a sense of mission and responsibility. So I think time was short for many of us, but you were also terribly patient with all of us in the ways uh, when we came to this task. So I want to, again, deeply uh, acknowledge this. So, and th that's why I think it was important. And you had that sense of timeliness, which historians pride themselves of having, but I'm afraid I'm not sure all of us had that. So your call was really an important one to, to answer. I would end by saying that I feel that it was a really a wonderful privilege to be able to do the deep reading and reflection on this project. You know, th that was a moment of intense and isolation and deep uncertainty for everyone about what would unfold. And, and we were all sort of huddled in our remote corners, and this is an opportunity to reflect on, for me, a field and to be in conversation with Kavita, to be in conversation with scholars from other time periods, to reflect on the experience that we were having. For me, it's been really generative for my teaching. In some ways, it was a validation of the field itself, uh, having much to contribute to not only the history of pandemics, but the moment that we were living through. So it, for myself, it was also, you know, I was at this point also the, the, the president of the American Association of History of Medicine. And there was a sense that, you know, we had, we had a responsibility in this moment, both as a association, but each individually as scholars to sort of shed light on this moment, based on the fact that we were sitting on this incredible resource of knowledge but I think in a very practical sense, there was one other reason why this was so important. And that was, you know, our graduate students were deeply uncertain about what the future would hold. And so the collaboration with Michael McGovern was at a moment of high uncertainty in which what I realized is that you could also use it as a way of creating a conversation, a collaboration, um, a partnership in moving through the past 
thinking about scholars who have written about this moment and thinking about you know the future of scholarship as well and so there that's a model that i think that i really appreciated and that i've also followed in other cases and i think i'm likely to continue as well so meaningful to me on so many different levels that's very gratifying to hear thank you all so much for so generously devoting your time to this podcast. It's been a long one, but I think wonderfully informative and hugely generative, to borrow a phrase that Keith just used. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. Today is October 19th, and I would like to thank everybody, our listeners, for tuning in, and we will see you at some future date with another set of our contributors.